All right, everybody. Hey, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming, and I'm just glad to see everybody here. Y'all are smiling. You made it through the winter, and uh, well, I wish I could say that that's how long winter is going to be in Virginia. Uh, so I was wrong. I apologize. We had more than one annual snowfall this winter. Um, I was wrong, but that's why I'm not a weatherman. That's all right, but I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that you're all able to be here. Who had fun in the snow? Just wondered, did anyone have, like, build any snowmen, go sledding? able to go and pick up some snowballs and build a snowman and they built snow forts so it was awesome watching them do that and last weekend they were sledding and uh, they wanted to see who could actually stick themselves in the pond which I'm glad no one actually did because I don't want to have to pull anyone out hypothermia and all that but we are we're excited to have you guys here um, just like last Sunday we're gonna have one service we're not gonna have evening service no choir practice and Lord willing things are gonna pick back up as normal be praying for Pastor Charles and his family because they are still out uh, Amy Miss Don and pastor uh, have some kind of coughing crud that is going on and uh, for once Carrie did not give it to them yes. <laughs> so Carrie is healthy <laughs> and he's able to be with us so uh, his immune system is working I appreciate that God designed our bodies uh, so, and uh, man, it is just good to be here. So just a few quick announcements. Of course, we're not having a evening service. So the Youth Sunday and the cookie contest, all that is getting put, uh, put off until next Sunday. So if you already baked your cookies, I'm sorry. You have snacks through the week. Um, <laughs> but we, hope, we hopefully got the word out soon enough that y'all didn't uh, have any uh, cookies baked. But we are going to do it again uh, come this Sunday night. All right, come with your appetites. Come with your uh, uh, cookies skillfully made. And we're going to have judges and see who gets the prizes. And if you have not signed up, we have a sign-up list back there on the back table. And anyone can sign up. Anyone can cook. Anyone can eat. It's totally fine. And it's open for anyone that, that wants to come and visit, too. Uh, let me see. What else are we missing? Yes, the, uh, I'm going to have Carrie get up and talk about the senior retreats at the edge and that's coming up this Saturday so if you are uh, of a senior saint then you are more than welcome to come out and he has all the information for that um, and I don't think I have anything else except for I do have one more thing and it's pretty important and we're going to see more about this later on in, in the month okay not next Sunday night but probably the next Sunday after that we're going to see a Dr. S.M. Davis video at some point in time to kind of prime us for our family conference. And we have it on our website. We have it on our uh, Facebook page as, as far as advertising goes. But Dr. S.M. Davis with SolveFamilyProblems.org, he is going to be here with us on the 20th of February. And all day, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, he's going to be preaching about the family. And he is excellent. He does uh, messages on husband-wife relations, on parents-child relations, on child-parent relations, on grandparent-grandchild relations, and just everything having to do with the home. Uh, he's preached over 500 messages just on the family and on the home. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. He's been married for over 50 years, and he's been preaching for almost that long. Uh, he is really, really a wealth of knowledge. And that following Sunday, or that following Monday night, we're going to have a couples-only night that's child care provided, so you have to RSVP the week prior. Child care, if you bring your children, make sure you bring them to the pastor's house. Don't bring them here. All right, bring them to the pastor's house, drop them off there. They're going to get stuff full of candy and pizza and have some fun and games and watch a movie. While the rest of us come here and we're able to eat a catered dinner, and then uh, Dr. Davis is going to uh, give us a talk on, uh, on Bible principles, Bible teachings that deal strictly with husband and wife. And that's why we can't have anyone that's not married there. That's why we can't have anyone that's a minor there because of what we're going to be talking about. But it's from the Bible on how you can better have a relationship with your spouse. Excellent things coming up on the 20th and the 21st. Uh, the other things we'll hear more about later I don't want to tell you about because we'll probably forget them. Just keep in mind, pray for our missionaries that are coming in. I'm going to let Carrie come up here, talk a little bit about what's going on this weekend, and then we're going to get up and sing. All right. Well, if you guys want to take your hymnals really quick and turn to number 661, while you're turning there, I'll tell you a little bit about our senior adult conference coming up at the edge. You can see the rack cards out there in the foyer. 
and um, it is this Saturday. So if you can, if you're wanting to go still, you can uh, let Pastor, or, well, let um, Brother Daniel know, and um, myself or Amy, one of them, we'd love to get your um, contact information in there so we can get you signed up and ready to go. Uh, you can actually go on the website, the Edge Christian Camp, and uh, you can sign up personally if you'd like to do that. Just let the church know that you're going. And uh, we'd love to have you. It's going to be a great day. We've got the Brent Rochester family coming in. They're going to be singing and playing bluegrass gospel music. And then um, we'll have uh, Brother Rochester preach. And so there's going to be a lot of great things. You might even get to see a few skits. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And there's going to even be prime rib, which that's the only reason why I'm going. So, um, <laughs> no, it's going to be a great day. We have a lot of fun. But in, until then, if you'll go ahead and take your hymnals, turn number 661. I got Miss Angie playing for me this morning. If you'll stand up together. God can do anything but fail. Number 661, let's sing this on that chorus. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save, He can keep, He can cleanse, and He will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's a fairest of 10,000 to my soul. God can do anything, anything, anything. Good. Miss Angie, I think we can do a little bit better, okay? Let's sing a little louder with our hearts unto the Lord. This morning, number 661, God can do. Do you believe that? I believe with all my heart, so let's sing it like we mean. Here we go, ready? God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything. Good. Sing it out now. He can save, he can keep, he can cleanse, and he will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's a fairest of 10,000 to my soul. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. All right, I want you to turn one more place with me, number 590. Really quickly, number 590. Since Jesus came into my heart, it's one of my favorite songs in the hymnal. Now, you got to watch really closely, okay, because there's some notes on the end that you might have to hold out a little longer. you got to get a deep breath. Number 590, we're going to do the first, second, and last verse. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have lied in my soul for what's all and gone Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins which were many All washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Joy or my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. On that last verse together, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into. Good, I want to hear you now. Yes, there you go. Then Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since came into my heart.
yet, Miss Angie? We gotta add something at the end, okay? So we're gonna try the fourth verse, all right? My dad, if he was here, he'd want me to do it. So watch me very close when we get to the end of that chorus. Let's sing the fourth verse together. There's a light in the valley of death now for me. Here we go, ready? There's a light in the valley of death now for me Since Jesus came into Yes, there you go, church. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Watch me closely. Joy or my soul like the sea billows roll. singing this morning. Are you glad to be saved? I'm so glad to be saved. You may be seated. All right. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming again. just want to say it means a lot to me that y'all want to brave the cold and be out here and uh, listen to me. Um, you're actually not coming to hear me, I hope. You're coming to hear what the Bible has to say. And uh, I'm praying that's what actually comes up. So y'all pray for me as I'm praying for you too. Uh, speaking of the Bible, we have one more opportunity so that we can go over our memory verse, which is what we're going to do now. And if you did grab a bulletin or have your bulletin from last week, that is great. If not, I ask that you open up your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. And that's our memory verse, and we're going to go over that, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday night. Now, we normally do that at the end of the month, and this is the end of the month, but we're not going to have an evening service at the end of the month, so we're just going to postpone that to next week. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Hope everyone's there. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. We're going to say it together. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. We could preach a message on that one verse, knowing the cross and knowing Jesus and him as Savior, most importantly in all your relationships and keeping that for most. So remember that, study that, you get a chance to get some candy. Uh, Amy, our secretary, got the good candy, so we're not going to give you guys the six-month-old little hard candies that no one wants to eat. It's actually the good Hershey's chocolate things, and the little Twix are in there, and M&Ms. Okay, it's the good stuff. So we have, let's go ahead and have the, our guys come down for the offering now. We'll take care of that, and then we'll have one more song and a special, and then we'll get into our message. Amen.
if you go ahead and take your hymnals one more time with me, turn to number 375, 375, you stand up together. I was reading in the Word of God this morning, and I was in the book of Psalms a little bit, as well in the book of Numbers, and uh, I was reading the verse when, uh, when it talks about, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And um, it goes on throughout the rest of the chapter, talking about praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And I thought about this song, about talking about when peace like a river attendeth my way. And the, the man that wrote this song actually went through a very, very hard trial, lost most of his family, and uh, ended up writing this song after this and saying that God can still give you peace. And this morning, I know there's a lot of sickness going around. I know there's a lot of stuff happening, but we still serve a gracious, kind God. And he still gives us peace in the time of storm. So I want to sing this song. All four verses, number 375, it is well with my soul. On that first verse, when peace like a river attended my way, when so third verse my sin verse. I want you to read it real quick with me. It says, And Lord haste the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds will be rolled back as a scroll. I'm glad for that day, aren't you? The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so it is well with my soul. Do you believe that day can be today? I believe that with all my heart. Let's sing that last verse unto the Lord. And Lord haste the day. And Lord haste the day when my face shall be sight. Oh 
the first notes on that chorus let's let's sing the first verse a cappella if you wouldn't mind when peace like a river just one more time a cappella here we go ready when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll what Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Great singing. You may be seated. part of the service getting to hear them sing and I like singing but I know that you guys have to put up with my singing when I'm up here singing so that's why I enjoy the people that actually know how to sing that get up there and sing that's why I'm so thankful that Carrie was back and um, it, it is just a joy to have people that uh, that come that when we hear them sing it just blesses us because not only is it praising God but it sounds nice 
But you know, God doesn't give that stipulation, uh, let he who has a great voice open his mouth and sing. That's not what the Bible says. All right. The Bible tells us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I was hearing a lot of joyful noise coming from that little seven-year-old chap right there. And uh, God looks on the heart when you sing. Did you know that? Like when you sing, yeah, God is your audience. This is not the message here, but I'm, I want to make sure that everyone knows that. And when we sing, it doesn't matter if you can sing good or if you, eh, you're just making a noise. I fall somewhere closer to that area. But still, God looks at the heart. And he says anyone can sing. Even if you have a, a monotone type voice and one volume, that doesn't matter. If you sing with a joyful noise, God is blessed with that. Amen. So I want you all to remember that. You know, don't be afraid to open your mouth and sing. Don't be afraid to open your mouth and praise God. I appreciate that song. Thank you. Who picked that song today? Say, Isabel, good job. Bow the knee, all right? Looking towards him. Did you know that that is the only time where you can get anything from God is when you are coming to him on your knees? When you bow before God and then you lift him up, you look up at him, realize that, wow, that is my savior right there. That is my God. And that's the only time that we're really going to get anything from him. It's not that we come to him because he's like the eternal Santa Claus and he gives gift. That's not who he is. But he is your heavenly father. If you come to him as, well, God, I'm, I'm just going to punch my quarter in and try to get a prize out of a machine, that doesn't work like that. God is our savior. And just knowing who he is and knowing how infinite God is, that will put us on our knees every time we come before him. You see, there's a lot of things we don't understand about God. And before we get into the message, um, I'm going to go ahead and pray. And y'all pray with me. Pray that we will hear from God's word and we'll be edified. And just like pastor says, give me a good hearing. OK, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for giving us this time together. And I pray that you please help us just to understand the principle that we're going to hear. I pray that you would help it to encourage us, Lord, and uh, just increase our faith, Lord. Thank you so much for the system that you have developed for us to live in your will. And we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, singing, not necessarily carrying a tone in a bucket, but singing with a joyful noise, that's just one of the systems that God has set up that God understands, but uh, on the fleshly side, we don't quite understand. And there are several things that go on on the fleshly side that we don't understand. Now, how many people like to wait a long time for their food at the drive-thru? <laughs> there is one restaurant, and uh, I'll tell you about my trip to this one restaurant, and um, the name of this restaurant clearly did not relate to the service we got that day. And it would be the last time I'm going to that particular one. And this place we went to was a place called Sonic. We went to Sonic, and it clearly was not that end of the spectrum. They had one person working there. And understand the time that we're working in, people just drop off on their jobs and don't show up, or they get sick. And there was this one lady, I assume she was a grandma there, working some job, so she has something to do. But there was just the one person. And we were the one person in line in the drive-thru. And I think we still sat there for like 20 minutes at the window, waiting for, I think we ordered... Uh, yeah, it was ice cream and like a hot dog. So, but still, why does it take that long? I don't understand that. I'm not in there working the inner workings of it all, so I don't understand. So looking up from the outside in, I look at this like it's taking too long. I'd rather, much, much rather go to Chick-fil-A and, you know, they have like 60 people in the drive through line, but you still get out of there in seven minutes. That moves a lot faster. And I don't understand how they do it in there. When I look in there, all I see is 13 people standing around, but they still push stuff out so fast. I really don't know how it happens. I don't understand the inner workings of what's going on. All I see is, hey, stuff's getting accomplished. We don't understand God's processes when it comes to his timetable, when we are on the outside looking in. God's ways are not our ways, and our thoughts are not his thoughts. And we would do well if we remember that because God reminds us that he is in charge 
And whenever we let God be in charge, things work out the best. It is always, always better to just trust his timetable. God's ways to get something done, they're not our ways, like I said. His timetable is his own. And his methods that go along with that timetable are his own as well. So I'll tell you about Paul. He was a man that trusted in a timeline and a methodology that was not his own. We're going to hear a little bit about, about what Paul was doing in his life here in this message. Other people throughout the Bible that we're going to see today, they lived in a timeline that was not their own. I'm going to explain this to you a little bit. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. That verse will tell us, that, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. God knows a lot more than we do, and we just don't understand what he's doing sometimes, but he knows what he's doing. He is the one in charge. He made us. He put us together so he knows how best to run us. We'll do good to follow what Paul told the Corinthian church. We're going to look at that here in a little bit. And that through Paul's weakness, God makes him strong. You see, he has his timetable in doing things. His timetable only has his numbers on it. We try to put our numbers on a timetable for our life, and that doesn't really work. Why is this not happening right now? Because God doesn't want it to happen right now. God says it might happen later. Or God says what you want to happen in your life is not going to happen at all. But I'll tell you one thing. God's going to give you the grace that you need to get through that portion of your life. He is. He does. Every single trial we go through, every valley we go through, God has an upside. And he's also giving you the strength and the ability to get through that valley. Luke chapter 8. I'd like you all to turn there. We're going to bounce around and show you several different portions of Scripture. This is more of a topical type message instead of an expository. Expository is when I'm just going through the Scripture and I'm telling you God's message in what a portion of Scripture is. And topical is what it sounds like, speaking of a topic. Well, here I'm speaking of the topic of trusting in God's timeline and not our timeline. It always works out better. God's timeline is always the best. So if we're in Luke chapter 8, we're going to go ahead and jump in it. I'm talking about a woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now this left her ceremonially unclean. And what, me what that meant was she couldn't hang out with anyone else. She had to separate herself. If she never got better, then she had to stay away from everyone. Kind of like a leper. A leper had to stay away from everyone. Detach themselves from society and couldn't be a part of the community around her. But this was going on for 12 years. It's obviously a long time. When we look at this scripture to tell us, and starting in verse 43 in chapter 8 in the book of Luke, And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling. And falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Look at her methods that she tried to use to cure herself of this problem. Now, I don't know what kind of illness this was. I could probably ask Miss Crystal. She could probably tell me a couple of different medical names and all that of what this could be. But all I know is what the Bible says. It was an issue of blood. There was something wrong in her body. It made her unclean and it was going on for 12 years. And she had tried several different ways to make this better. She went to all the doctors, tried all the wacky things. She went to the natural doctor. She went to the regular doctor. She went to this other doctor. She went, and she spent all her money. And she was done being able to fix the problem herself. That's a lot of times where God shows up and says, hey, guess what? You spent all your time trying to do things yourself and trying to fix them yourself when you really should have been looking up here. When we look at what happened with this lady, maybe she wasn't told about Jesus. Maybe she wasn't told about the method that God had to fix problems. Jesus had already been around for a couple years by this time, and his teachings had already gone throughout all the land where this woman lived. Maybe she wasn't told that you needed to have faith in God to heal you, but looking at it from the problem side, our fleshly side starts to take over. I have a problem. 
I don't like this problem. I'm uncomfortable in this problem. I want this problem fixed now. So that's why she started handing out her money, going to the different doctor's offices, looking up Wikipedia, and looking up, uh, what are some of those other ones? What, what's the one that always tells you you have cancer? WebMD, Web there you go. <laughs> you can say, I have a cut on my fingers, cancer. I probably wouldn't use WebMD. <laughs> but all her resources on these different methods of trying to make her feel better and none of them worked. That's like our lives. When we look at our lives and things that we try to fix in our lives and we try to do them in our methods and we try to do them in our know-how, it doesn't work. You see, God's know-how is solid truth. Our know-how is like Wikipedia. It changes on the day. And we can't get anywhere just in our trusting of methods and things like that. We have to trust in the Lord. And Remember that song that they sang? Excellent choice of song. God's ways are not our ways. How do we approach God? On our knees. How did she approach God? When the women saw that she was not hid, she came trembling. That was a choice that she had. When she saw that she was not hid, she could have ran into the crowd. She could have retreated. But when she saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared before all the people what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. You see, the Bible tells us that in order to be saved, we have to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. We have to be willing to agree that God says that we are wrong, that we are sinners, and that we need a Savior, and that our destination is hell. Believe in our heart that Jesus Christ has saved us, that he has died and was buried and rose again, and we shall be saved. He uses all those legal terms, shall, that's a great term in the Bible. Look up that term and see where exactly God puts those words and what they mean. But the woman came forward and she confessed what she did. She trusted. She was scared. Yeah. A lot of people get scared for stage fright. That's kind of like what she had right now. Did she want to go up in front of all those people? No. But one of the things that helped her was her trust in the Lord outweighed her stage fright. We can use that in witnessing. Our trust in the Lord outweighs our stage fright. Do I want to go talk to someone about the Lord? Do I want to go tell this person I've never met before about a Savior? Our trust in the Lord should outweigh our stage fright. And that's what happened to this woman. And she confessed. And people were able to praise God. Did it matter to God that she was 12 years in this issue? I'm going to tell you God hurt for it. But that wasn't the timeline God had for her. You see, God gives us grace to live in his timeline, not in our timeline. He gives us grace to live in his timeline. So when things don't happen in our timeline, there is no reason that we should get all upset about it. Jesus came in his time to a man that was by a pool. In John chapter 5, I say, y'all go there with me. In John chapter 5, I'll give you time to get there. Our lives are but a vapor. The Bible tells us that. So, and the Bible also says that a thousand years are as a day and a day are as a thousand years to the Lord. You see, our timeline is not God's timeline. God is outside of time. Does it matter how many days pass? No, it doesn't. Because God in each one of our lives has certain things that he wants us to do. And his time always works best. That lady lasted 12 years with this issue of blood. This man had an issue that was a lot longer. In John chapter 5, if you're there with me, uh, just go ahead and read along with me, starting in verse 2. Now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, and waiting for the moving of the water. Can you imagine this scene? There's this one pool in the middle of this big open area with five different porches, five different platforms for people to sit on, and it was covered in lame people, covered in blind people, covered in deaf people, covered in people with issues of blood, covered with people that needed healing. And it was covered in them. It was full of them. And this man was one of them, and he'd been there a while. For the angel went down at a certain season, in verse 4, into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. That's a little bit more than twelve years. Twelve years is a long time, but thirty-eight years is, is still a longer time. An infirmity, 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had 
uh, been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? This actual conversation, this discourse between Jesus and this man that was laying there, didn't take but a moment. And you see, our decision that we can make to respond to the calling of Christ doesn't take but a moment. But when he comes, he comes with every bit of power necessary to get you out of your problem, get you out of what's going on in your life. Whether it's sin, whether it's a lost person that is in need of salvation, and God comes, his Holy Spirit pricks your heart, and then you respond in faith to him, eternally you are changed at that second. Eternally you are changed in that second. Look what happened to this man right here. 38 years he's been laying in the same spot. 38 years, all he's known is those five porches and this revolving crowd of sick and wounded folk. That's all, he know, that's all he's known. Hasn't known a normal life. I don't know how old he was. I don't know when he was hurt. I don't know if he was born hurt or wounded or, or lame or whatever it was. I don't know. But 38 years is a long time to sit there laying on a porch. There are some southern people that probably do that. But, you know, front porch sitting. So, sitting there on a porch, Jesus showed up at a certain moment in his life, wilt thou be made whole? He does that with us. He did that with me two years ago with a call to preach. I didn't know what I was going to do in my life. I didn't know where I was going to go. I knew I was going to retire. I knew that I had a job here for a little bit, but I didn't know what God's will for my life was until he made me realize from the scriptures that this was going to be my job for the rest of my life. I was 38, 38 years old when that actually happened. Isn't that a coincidence? 38 years old when I figured out what my career was supposed to be. By the way, I'd already gotten done with a career in the army. Did that matter to God? No. That was just what I had been doing until I got to where God wanted me to be. And that's what happens with all of us. That's what happened to the woman with the issue of blood. She lived her life until, God, until she got to where God wanted her to be. That's where this man that had the infirmity, that was wounded, that was, had this uh, crippling issue, that's the point of his life where he got to where God wanted him to be. I'm going to tell you, each and every time that people get to this certain point, there is one common thing. They are on their knees. They look up at God and they see him as Lord and Savior. They see him as the God, the Lord of their lives. That's what happens to the woman with the issue of blood. That's what happens here. He looks at the man and says, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But when I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith to him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. And he took up his bed and walked. This is amazing how God's power comes at a certain moment. And it comes with such intensity that it is able to fix whatever issue it is. Amen. Folks, if you know someone that is not saved, this is the same power that helped you. If you know someone that has an issue in their life that is just not seeming to get better, this is the same power that fixes issues in your life. How do we approach God? We approach God on our knees. And we approach God saying, God, whatever your will is for my life, give me the grace to get through it right now. Those songs, great choice on those songs, Carrie. Looking at those uh, situations in our life, the only thing we can do is say, God, just give me grace for this moment. Give me grace for this time I'm in. 38 years is a long time, but God can fix even problems that last even longer than that. Y'all go to John chapter 9 with me, if you will. John chapter 9. He fixed a problem that was 12 years long. He fixed a problem that was 38 years long. We can see that God fixes lifetime problems. You have things that are gone wrong since before you can remember. You have things that are happening that aren't supposed to be since the start of your journey on this earth. Well, God can fix that too. Why is that? Because God made you. He knows exactly how to fix you. When I was working in the, an army, army aviation field, we ran into some issues, and I worked on the electrical side where all these weird things happen sometimes. Boxes don't like to communicate with other boxes, and they make the aircraft do really weird things, and it's even beyond uh, our understanding. That's a great understanding anyways. But it's beyond our understanding in our shop, and we look at these things like, I have no idea. And all of us are coming and putting together our heads and trying to think, and we're looking at books, and we're looking at... Uh, descriptions of systems and we're looking at electrical printouts and they look like big 
huge sheets of spaghetti and we're trying to figure out where these different signals are going and why this thing is causing an issue and we're like, I don't know. So what do we do? We have this great guy that worked at Boeing and since Boeing was the ones that fixed the aircraft, that built the aircraft, why not go to the people that built the aircraft that understand how it works? And so that's what we do. When we get to one of those issues, we go to these guys that work at Boeing or go to these guys that worked at Sikorsky and we say, I don't know. And then they come with these crazy ideas and these other pieces of paper that we've never seen before. And it's like, ah, that's how it works. And then we fix it. I'm not trying to compare God to a guy that works at Boeing. But I am trying to say that sometimes we need to appeal to a higher power to get an understanding. And yeah, it's kind of a humbling thing for me in my line of work that I did take a part in to realize that hey, I don't know what's going on and I need help. But that's the way that we need to approach God. He wants us to approach God like that. He wants us to approach him saying, hey, you're my heavenly father. Can you fix this, please? If we try to fix it ourselves, we become like that lady with the issue of blood, spending all of our living, go to different physicians and trying these different methods and getting nowhere. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, and night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made the clay of the spittle, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. I would look at that and say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. He just spat on some dirt and rubbed it in his eye. I'm glad he's blind because he can't, doesn't realize he can't see. But Lord, you just rub some clay in his eyeballs. Again, I want to say, I don't understand everything that God does. But it's because it's God's ways and not my ways. God does things in God's time. God does things in God's method. Look what happened to this man. Didn't matter that God put clay on his eyeballs. Verse number seven, he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. This man with a lifelong issue of being born blind. He was an adult person who had never seen anything in his life. And God did something that's seemingly just strange. But it doesn't matter because God is the one that knows how to fix things. You see, he could have done something else. He could have just covered his eyes. He could have just spoke to his eyes. He could have just thought about the issue. But the important thing is that God had the power to fix it. I want you to look at these three things before we get started. I said started. Actually, we're keeping on going. This is not one of those sermons where the introduction lasts half an hour. We are making progress. But each one of those things, look at what happened with the woman. As Jesus was passing through the neighborhood, he wasn't actually going to see this woman. He was going to see this Jewish ruler's um, child that was uh, dead. And he was going to heal this little person. He wasn't even going to go see her, but... She just happened to catch him as he was passing by. Jesus was going through the pool in Siloam. And it could have been a moment where he was just passing by. Right here, Jesus was passing by when this blind man was there and heard that Jesus was there. How long do we have to respond? We have those moments where Jesus is passing by in our life. Why is he only passing by for a moment? Because he wants us to always have our eyes on him because he is our heavenly father. He is the one we're supposed to be paying attention to. And it's like when I was preaching last time, hey, it's time to go get ice cream. If I'm not paying attention to that call, if I'm not paying attention to that request, I'm going to miss it. Folks, God calls and calls and calls and calls. You know that he preached everywhere where he went at least twice in Israel, sometimes more than that, several times, because he didn't want people to only get one call. He didn't want people to only get one opportunity to get saved. He didn't want people to only get one opportunity to get healed. He doesn't want us to only have one opportunity, but 
it's sad when we have to take more than one call or more than two calls or more than three calls. He's the only one that has the answers. And when God comes down and speaks to us, we should respond. When God comes down and speaks to us, we should say, yes, Lord. You remember, it's his timeline. When is God passing through your life? Not when are you passing by God's house? That's not how this works. When a lost person needs to get saved, a lost person doesn't get saved according to their timeline. A lost person doesn't get saved when I feel like it or when I've grown up a little bit or after I've gone to college for a little while or as I'm getting older or after I've had kids or after I get married. A lost person doesn't get saved then. But the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation and now is the accepted time. You know, it works like that in our life as Christians. When God has a call for you, God calls you for something right now. God didn't call me to preach when I was 22. He called me to preach when I was 38. God called me to preach when I was a little older in life, but then he called Carrie to preach when he was much younger. Why is that? I don't know, but that's God's timeline. And everyone's timeline for their lives is different. So I'm not looking at other people in their lives to try to figure out my timeline for my life. God has a timeline for each and every one of our lives. I want to go to a story in 2 Kings, the Old Testament story, 2 Kings chapter 6. And it's just a couple of verses. You see, God fixes these long-time issues. He also reaches down and does things immediately. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 5, it says, But as one was felling a beam, and this is Elisha, a story of him, and they're going to build a tabernacle. One was felling a beam. The axe head fell into the water, and, and he cried and said, Alas, master, it, for it was borrowed. He's chopping some wood. And for whatever reason, the axe head flies off of the axe handle as he's swinging, and it falls in the water. Kind of hard to go retrieve an iron axe head after it's fallen into the lake. If you look at the pond behind our house and you step in the pond, there's about that much sediment in the bottom of that pond. You're not finding anything if it goes in there, especially if it's that heavy to fall down to the bottom. He says, alas, for it was borrowed. Oh, man, I got to owe an axe head now. The man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. He cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up, uh, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. The iron axe head immediately came back up. God fixed an issue immediately. Does God always work long term? No, he can work immediately right now. He can work very short term. Think of what happened to Peter in Matthew chapter 14. We're going to jump to the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 14 is starting in verse 25. It tells us, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come out unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased, and they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. He reached down and saved Peter immediately. And why did he have to do that? Because Peter took his eyes off the Lord. Sometimes we get in a situation where we take our eyes off God and he looks at us and says, okay, again. And he reaches down and picks us up. Why is that? Because we're his children. You have to do the same thing to your children. Your children don't always walk straight lines. Your children don't always watch where they step. Your children don't even watch what they put in their mouths. How do I know that? Because I got kids too. So I know what they do, and I know that sometimes they need immediate attention. <laughs> God is able to do things in the immediate, and he's also able to do things in the long term. Why is that? Because he's got a timeline that is not ours. And we don't understand it, but we don't have to understand it. We just have to trust. Whenever someone tells you something that goes on in your life and you don't understand it, and they say, trust me. What does that mean? That means I'm agreeing with you, even though I don't understand what you say, but I'm going to believe what you're telling me. That's trusting. Not only that, I'm going to act upon what you're telling me. 
even though I don't understand the processes that you're giving me. I do not want to understand the processes that God has made this universe in. I can't. I cannot wrap my mind around it. There are over, I'm bringing some, out some uh, FBI knowledge here, but if you take an inch of copper, that's one inch of copper, there are trillions of protons that span this one inch of copper. Trillions. I can't fathom how big that number is. If you were to take, let's say, distance between the earth and stars and compare that to stacking up pieces of paper, if you were to say that a thickness of a piece of paper is the distance between the earth and our sun, it would take 70 pieces of paper to get to Pluto. It would take a stack of paper 300 miles high to get to the nearest star, aside from our sun. One piece of paper is the distance between our earth and the sun. Do I understand how big and vast that is? No. I just have to trust that God did it, because I can't put that together in my head. I cannot. To get to the farthest part of the galaxy, to span from one end of our galaxy to the other, it would take a stack of paper that is millions of miles high. I cannot understand that. But praise God, God does. And if God can understand something like that, and God can put something together, I can trust that he is going to let me sit here for a while until I get to where he wants me to be. If I have an issue going on in my life, I can trust that he knows when to pull me out of that issue. And I can trust that if he decides not to pull me out of that issue, he's going to give me the grace to get through it. Again, Romans chapter... I'm sorry, I'm not there yet. And we're getting to the point where he can choose not to fix the thing that you're going through. Now, this is only for saved folks. I want to tell you that right now. The Bible does say that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Talking about salvation. If you are lost in need of a Savior, he is willing that, willing that everyone get saved. This is a problem that you have in your life that everyone can get fixed when they trust in the Lord. Everyone can. Whatever kind of race, creed, language, age you are, doesn't matter. This is something that everyone can get fixed. But there are things that he chooses in our life to say, you don't need that. And that's kind of hard to take. Can you imagine having a hangnail that never goes away? Not something on a finger you don't use, but imagine a hangnail like on your thumb or on your pinky toe. Constantly hitting it on things. It snags on your socks. That'll get annoying after a while. But then it never goes away. What do you do? You have to trust that God is going to get you grace to get through it. Now, of course, we have things that can take care of a hangnail. That was just an example. But there are things in our life that God will sometimes keep in our life. I want to tell you about Paul now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you can go there and turn there with me if you will. 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, we're going to start in verse number 2. And this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church. And in the previous chapter, he was talking about boasting. And what are the dangers of boasting? How great am I? What are my accomplishments? Uh, how amazing, how awesome I am. Look at these things that I've done. He talked about these dangers of boasting. And starting in verse number 2, he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, and whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. And such an one caught up into the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory. I don't know who he's talking about here. He may be talking about John the Baptist when God... Uh, took him up in a vision to see the end things that are going on. I don't know who he's talking about here, but what he's saying is, I'm going to glory in someone else's things. I'm going to glory in the things that God has shown them. I'm going to glory in the skills and the attributes and the abilities and the accomplishments of someone else, but of the things that I'm going to do in my life, I'm not going to glory in those. I'm not going to flaunt myself. I'm not going to puff myself up. That's what he's telling us here. That's what he's telling the Corinthian church. 
He says, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given me a thorn in the flesh. Now we heard about this thorn of the flesh, and a lot of times people ponder, like, what is this thorn of the flesh? Maybe he had an issue with his eyesight. Maybe he had an issue with another part of his body. Now, we don't know what it is, but the thing that we, that we know for sure that is more important than what exactly is this thorn of the flesh is that he has this in his life to remind him not to be proud and boastful of the things that God has given him. He was the chiefest of the apostles. He had gotten so much from the Lord. We see this in this previous statement, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations I want you to look at who wrote most of the New Testament. That was this man. That was Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament, this Bible that we have right here and that we trust. He taught the most about salvation through this book, but he said, I'm not going to glory in any of that. And to remind me, God put something in my life to remind me to stay humble. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Can you imagine how prideful he would get if he had nothing going on in his life? And he'd be like one of those super annoying people in high school that you knew that was like the starting quarterback and that was always perfect and got straight A's and did everything great. And he was the fastest person, the most coordinated person. Uh, he could dance and sing and everything. And you just look at this kind of person and it's like, why is this guy able to do everything? Why? He had a thorn in the flesh to remind him not to be boastful thorn in the flesh to remind him not to praise himself because he could have he very well could have listed hundreds and hundreds of things happen that says look what god did in my life look at this look how great i am because god did it no this thorn in the flesh was put there to remind him not to do that he was a messenger of satan to buffet him and lest he should be exalted above measure for this thing i besought the lord thrice that it might depart from me and look at what god tells him and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Amen. Amen. That is right. My grace is made perfect in weakness. What weakness did he have? He had this thorn in the flesh that reminded him constantly. It could have been a limp. It could have been a gimpy-legged little guy that walked around. It could be because he couldn't grow any hair. I don't know. Who knows what this uh, thorn in the flesh is, but it was sent there to remind him constantly to be humble and remind him constantly to depend on the Lord for strength. Amen. And I believe that's how God used him so powerfully, gave him so many of these revelations, inspired him to write so much scripture because he depended on God to lead him through his life and lead him through his infirmities. If we have that kind of attitude with our Lord, imagine what the Lord can do through us. Imagine how many people could get saved because we are paying closer attention to the Lord. Imagine how many people could get discipled, how many churches, how many missionaries in foreign countries, how many languages we can get our Bible translated into. Imagine all of this stuff if we would just remember to stay humble before our God. If we would remember to trust in His timeline and not gripe and complain because God doesn't work according to our timeline. He says, Therefore will I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Then when I am weak, then am I strong. You see, when we remove ourselves from the equation, that only leaves God. I'm going to give you a simple math lesson, okay? You can write this down if you want to. You don't need a calculator for it because I don't know what button would be the value for this thing that I'm going to tell you. Okay, one plus God equals enough. What happens when you take the one away? God equals enough. What happens when we are too weak to do anything in our own power? Well, God equals enough. But what happens when we're strong? What happens when I am able? What happens when I am smart enough? What happens when my accomplishments are, I'm doing pretty good. That means that God part is not there. 
So we can see basic algebra knowledge. We can take the one away and then God equals enough. But if we take the God away, we are very lopsided. One equals nothing, pretty much. That's why we need God in our lives. That's why we need to approach God on our knees. That's why we need to glory in the infirmities that we're in and trust God to get us through it. And trust God in His timeline. Romans 11.33 tells us, Oh, the depth of His riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. We don't know what our Lord is thinking when He does something, and I don't. I don't know why God created the things that He created. I don't know why God made a platypus. I really couldn't tell you. I don't know why God makes lightning fall from the sky. I don't know why God made it snow twice in Virginia this year in the same week. I couldn't tell you why. But God's ways are past finding out. And it doesn't do me any good to try to correct God because I can't. I just have to trust in His methods that it is going on and He's the author of it. Each of these events had hurting people that were required to do one thing. They were required to look to Jesus. Each of these, these events had something in common where Jesus was passing by. It was a moment in time where the Lord proposed a call and we had to be humble enough to hear it and answer it. Because us in our pride, if we say we cannot listen to you right now, Lord, we cannot respond to this call right now, Lord, we cannot do what you want us to do right now, Lord, we take God out of the equation I talked about and it is just one equals nothing. God passed by and people responded. God passed by on his own time and people responded. And that's what we have to remember in our lives today. He helped them soon. He helped them later. Sometimes he didn't help at all, but he was there. He gave Paul grace to get through it. My grace is sufficient in thee. He helped that woman at 12 years, helped that man with the infirmity in 38 years, helped a lifelong blind person. All that stuff, the time, the earthly time that they were in doesn't matter. What does matter is people responded in God's time. If you're not saved, the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. How many times are you going to wait for God to pass by? God, in His earthly ministry, with Jesus walking on the, on the earth, passed by at least twice on foot, walking through these cities, each and every town, and preaching the kingdom of God. The first time, there were people that listened and people that believed and people that trusted Him. There were people that did not listen as well. The second time, there were more people that believed. There were more people that trusted. But there were also the same people that didn't. How many times are you going to let God go through your life before He stops coming? Trust in Him today. Whatever infirmity you're going through, Christian, trust in Him. Whatever thing is going wrong in your life, trust in Him. If you're not saved... Don't wait for another time for God to pass by. Because the next time He comes, you might not be here. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Just trust in Him. His timeline is the best. And since He's the author of everything, I'm pretty sure He knows what He's doing. So we're going to have time of invitation right now. And I'll ask Carrie if you would come up here. I don't know if you had an invitation song already planned. Um, but I'll have Carrie come up here and, and we'll sing a song. And if you have something to deal with the Lord for, then now is the time to come do it. Because you remember, God is calling right now. God's word goes out and God's word doesn't return void. He's shown you something in your life that you need to deal with. He's shown you a situation where you need to praise God for. And he's shown you something where you need to be grateful for. He's also shown you something where you're doing good. And you are, you're praising him. So just be thankful for those times. But God's word goes out and we respond. And that's how it works. So this is your time. You know, if Carrie come up here, I'm going to quit talking. And we'll let everyone do business with the Lord. Thank you. I have decided to follow Jesus. We'll sing this. If God's working in your heart, now is the time. Like Brother Daniel just said, come down and just spend some time with Jesus this morning. He's worth it. Number 470, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Would you sing that first verse one more time with me? I have decided to follow Jesus. Think about those words as you sing them now. If you really mean it, then sing it. To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I'm going to ask Miss Angie to keep playing. we got a few more at the altar. If you just pray for those that are at the altar, and maybe you can do business with God in your own seat this morning. people praying. I don't want to end too early because people have business they're still dealing with God right now. So just a couple more uh, minutes, another verse, and then we'll, uh, we'll close. Take this time to remember our folks that we're praying for on a prayer list. There's a lot of hurting people, a lot of people with COVID, uh, a lot of injured people, Thinking of uh, Mr. Bunny at the Convalescent Center. Pray for him. Father, thank you for giving us this time together, Lord. We love you and thank you for dying on the cross for us, Lord. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for being the one that just engineered our timeline, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we can trust in the plan that you have for us more than we can trust in our own plan. Lord, pray that you please help us to all live out your will for us today and be safe on the way home. Lord, help us to drive carefully as it gets colder outside and the roads become icy. And uh, I pray that you please uh, help us to come back next point in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for FBI class. We have class tomorrow, unless you hear otherwise. But it should be warm enough that we have class. So come on out, join us, and uh, it be a blessing. We'll see you all Wednesday then.